Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out to be with us today. We are honored by that. And if there's anything we can do uh, for you, uh, to help you in any way, I hope you'll let us know. Can't promise that we can always help, but we will stand there with you in whatever you're going through. Just glad you're here. If you're looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. We'd love to talk with you about what God's doing in our church. We'd love to hear what he is doing in your life and see where those stories are can come together. Just really glad you're here. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and put that in the collection plate when it passes in just a moment. That's a great song for us to start with this morning because there is a lot going on in our world and in the lives of our family uh, that we need help in overcoming. Uh, We'll have a prayer a little bit later on this morning about the Florida situation, but one of our members um, is going through something right now, one of our families, and we're going to take a moment and have a special prayer for her and her family. Uh, Farrah, can you and Wes and the girls come on up? Farrah Rawlings uh, was diagnosed, Dan, you can come on up too, with cancer um, sometime back, and um, been through a lot of different treatments, felt like it was all handled, and then most recently this past week, we got some news that there's been a recurrence. So we wanted to have them up, and I tell you what, if you want to come up and just pray with them, you are welcome to come up here and join us. Dan Beasley is one of our shepherds. He is going to pray. This may seem like kind of an odd thing to you uh, if, it's, if it's 
not in your uh, experience, but we just love each other and we want to be there for each other and we believe the Lord has the power to do whatever he wills and so we're trying to surround this family with love and support. So let's pray as Dan leads us. God, you are, um, as we just sang, you are the name we, we look to. You are the creator of all things. You're the creator of heaven and earth. You made us create our bodies in your image. You gave us each other. You're the source of everything. Um, Father, we come to you as a church here, all of us, once here touching each other, touching Farah, Wes, Allison, Olivia, uh, the ones seated. We're here in one heart um, calling out to you. Calling out to you, Father, asking you to look down, look down and see. Uh, see this servant of yours, Father. Just op open your eyes. Do not let your arm be short right now, Father, to them. Um, we pray for Farah, pray for Wes and these girls. Um, look at this dear servant, Lord. Look at her faith. Look at what a demonstration she and Wes, the girls have been to us already. Think of, think of them, Lord. And um, Look at um, courage. Look at, Lord, look at uh, their marriage, their children. We beg of you, God. We beg of you. Um, be here now for them, God. Do not turn away and uh, be with them tomorrow as they meet with doctors, bless the doctors. We pray, God, we know when this healing comes, it will be from you. We thank you for it. We know, we know your strength, your power, your ability to, to, to heal our spiritual needs and our body needs. We, we look forward to it, Father. We know you will and trust you. Help us, Father, to rely on you. Help Wes, Farah, girls. Um, Grow in their faith. Continue to be such a powerful example to us. Help us to grow in our faith as we look at them. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. And by his hand we stand in victory. And by his name we overcome. Praise the Lord, a mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. And by his hand we stand in victory. And by his name we overcome. Let me please let's stand together. Psalm 118 says, This is the day the Lord has made. Brothers and sisters, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's sing. This is the season for a new anointing. This is the season for a fresh outpouring. That the sons and daughters of the King of glory may arise and shine. That the sons and daughters of the King of glory may arise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. In the beginning God created, and for his pleasure. Son and daughter of the King of glory, now arise and shine. Every son and daughter of the King of glory, now arise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let your glory fill the earth. Let your glory fill the earth. Let your glory. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day. 
is the day that the Lord has made. King of glory, fill the earth. 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 As we declare, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day. seated as we take our offering, please. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they Fix our eyes on you and 
If you wonder why we gather to lay hands on and pray over a brother and sister, it's because we believe in a God who saves. And so I'd invite you as we gather around the table to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you've been reading through your Bible with us, and I hope you have, today's reading finds you in Deuteronomy chapter 38 through 40. In Deuteronomy 39 and 38, we find a listing of the Feast of Israel. Among those feasts is the Passover. I don't know that it's possible for us to overstate the significance of the Passover for the people of Israel. It is so significant that when God instituted that feast, He completely restructured their calendar so that the year began in remembrance of that event. On the tenth day, the people of Israel would bring a lamb into their household. And on the fourteenth day, they would slaughter that lamb. The blood of that lamb would then be placed on the wooden posts of their door frame. All of this happened because Exodus 3 tells us that God the God we just prayed to, that God saw the affliction of the people of Israel. That God heard their cry, and that God knew their sufferings. And that God moved. And so on that day, as the blood was spread on the doorposts, and the people of Israel went into their homes, the angel of death brought the judgment of God upon the enemies of God. But those hidden behind the blood were passed over. They were saved. They were brought out of their slavery and they were saved from death. And Paul knew all of this. But Paul only knew part of the reality because everything we've just told you is simply a shadow that points to something much, much greater. That's why 1 Corinthians 11 says these words, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, it's amazing that John the Baptist could look up on the hillside and say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And just as on that day in Egypt, the blood of a lamb smeared on the wooden post of a door frame saved a people from slavery and from death, So some 2,000 years ago, the blood of the Lamb of God slain and smeared on the wooden post of a cross save us from our slavery to sin and from the death that that slavery brings. And so, Father, as we take this bread, we remember the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world. Amen.
just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me not to tells us that this supper is two things. Just as Israel at the beginning of each year remembered that Passover event when they were saved from slavery and saved from death, Paul tells us that in this supper we remember the death of Christ. The death that purchased our freedom from our slavery to sin and the death that gave us life and freed us from the grave. But he also says it is a proclamation. When we come together to partake of this bread and this cup, we proclaim the gospel to ourselves, to our fellow believers, and to a watching world that in spite of all my wickedness, in spite of the indelible stain of sin, that blots my life like ink on paper. There is one who has made me clean. There is one who has borne that cost. Father, it is amazing that the blood of the Lamb can take these scarlet robes of mine and make them white as snow can wash away every sin in this room. Not just the sins of the past, but the sins of today and every sin we will commit for the rest of our life. And make us new. And bring us into your kingdom, not simply as subjects, not as vassal states, but as children of yours. And so, Father, as we take this cup, as we take this bread, we do it remembering the precious blood of the Lamb who gave himself on a cross some 2,000 years ago. And we do it proclaiming the good news of the gospel that by that blood we are saved. It's in his name we pray it. Amen.
just as I am and wait not to So I know that you were uh, having the same reactions that I think everyone around the country had this past week when we heard the news of yet another school shooting, this time down in Florida. Uh, 17 students, a teacher, 
what do you say? Thoughtlessly, for no reason. Um, it just reminds you of how uh, vulnerable our children are, how vulnerable our teachers are, and our school administrators are in situations like this. We had a note handed to us just this morning, in fact, um, about some events that have happened at, Dis at Discovery Middle School here in Huntsville. Not of the violent nature, but just as traumatic for the people involved, I would think. Um, seventh grade English teacher was hit by a car. Uh, her name is Emily Stevenson, and she's had to have her uh, right lower leg amputated below the knee. And then in a separate incident, uh, one of their seventh grade students was killed in a single car accident. So at Discovery Middle School, they're enduring their own kind of struggle and asking their own questions and wondering why and what next. So I wanted to take just a minute, acknowledge what's going on in our world, what's happening right here in our community, not just what's going on in our church. And I want to ask you again, let's just, let's just pray about that. And I want to specifically pray for the, the families of the kids down in Florida, for the family of uh, the young man that uh, did the shooting. And I want to pray for all of our kids and teachers. So let's, let's bow together. God, we know that um, when we, if, if we feel lost for words at the senselessness of the kind of violence that we saw this week down in Florida, if we are offended by it and shocked by it, if we are hurt by it, then you are infinitely more hurt because you are the God who sees everything and you know everything, and um, you love each one of those precious students that were killed and the teacher that was killed, the coach. Uh, and even though it's beyond uh, us, you love the young man that killed them. And so you feel the, this pain in ways that we could we not only can't imagine it, we will never be able to imagine it because of the distance between the infiniteness that is you and the finiteness that is us. But God, we feel it. We feel We felt it all week. We feel the fear and the anger, the not knowing what to do, how to respond to it. We feel the enormous... Uh, grief vicariously about these, uh, for these families that have lost these precious teenagers who had so much to offer and so much ahead of them and all these hopes and dreams that had been poured into them by their families and their teachers and their friends and they themselves had and now they're gone. We don't know what to do with that. And so we, we pray for your comfort for these families. And we pray that these children will be received into your arms. And we pray for the young man who did all of this violence, for the redemption of his soul. We pray for the faculty and the student body at Discovery in this time of loss and grief for them. But we pray that you'd give them a sense of your presence, especially Emily, the teacher, and Bless her and the family of the child that was killed in the other car wreck. And God, we lift up all of our kids and our teachers and their schools, and we ask you to keep them safe. Spare them, deliver them. Here in Huntsville and then all over the country, all over the world, protect our children from the evil one and anyone who is in league with him. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you guys. Um, we are beginning a new series this morning in the book of uh, Joshua. It's artfully titled Joshua, uh, Faith for Where We've Never Been. Uh, and we're not, we're not quite there yet in our reading schedule, but we'll be there before the series is over. So if you haven't joined us, Lee mentioned that this morning. I think Lee must be on an accelerated version. I'm still in the last part of Numbers. Uh, so, uh, Lee's in Deuteronomy, he reads faster than I do. Uh, but if you, if you haven't joined us in that yet, look, I think we've got like 85% of the year left. 
just jump in where we are, pick up on num- uh, last part of Numbers or Deuteronomy this week, and just, uh, you, you missed some of the hard stuff in Leviticus, okay? Don't worry about it. <laughs> Let's go. Just join us in reading this. You can t- check with Steve Krieger on our staff here, or there's a table downstairs uh, in the fellowship hall that can give you information. Look, nobody is keeping score on this, okay? And even if they did, the points don't count, so don't worry about it. Just join in with us. The book of Joshua is full of these wonderful stories and vexing questions. Uh, When I was a child, our our Sunday school teacher dressed us up in robes and led us around a a block-built replica of Jericho. Uh, I think my robe was magenta, I'm not sure, but uh, we did that for six Sundays. Uh, we, 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 in a row, we, every week we'd, we'd march silently around the walls, not saying a word. And every week the tension would kind of build until we got to that seventh Sunday. And then just like the Israelites did on the seventh time, they marched around the city. We shouted and the walls came tumbling down and it was the most awesome Sunday school lesson. I'm talking about it, you know, 50 years after the fact. Um, children's Bible story books and Sunday school lessons draw liberally from Joshua. But we, gotta, we need to be really crystal clear about this. It is as grown up a book as there is in the Bible. For example, I don't remember our teacher raising the thorny issue of why God would order the annihilation of every living creature in Jericho and other cities as well. Or I don't remember my teacher bringing up that Rahab was anything other than an innkeeper, right? Or why an entire family was punished for the crime of its patriarch, Achan. Joshua, like a lot of other books in the Bible, raises questions for which there are no easy answers. It teaches us lessons we didn't even know we needed to learn. And it challenges us in ways that we would just as soon avoid. So what I'm telling you is this is not going to always be fun. Now, another thing we need to be clear about as we enter into this series, and I want you to hold me to this, the book of Joshua is not really about Joshua. It's about God. The the preacher in me wants to simply mine the book for great moral lessons. And I've done that in the past with titles like Profiles in Leadership from Joshua or Walls Still Fall. This is one of my my best ever. Walls Still Fall, Three Strategies to Overcome Any Obstacle, which sounds like something Joel Osteen would preach. I'm sorry. There are moral and ethical lessons in this book, in any book of the Bible, and we'll learn them, but the book of Joshua is not merely about the things that its namesake did and said. It's about what God did for and through and sometimes in spite of Joshua and especially the people he led. If we're handing out Academy Awards, Joshua might get Best Supporting Actor. God's got the lead role in this. And then... One more thing in terms of clarifying what we're getting into when we get into the book of Joshua. And this is why we keep wanting you to join us to be in the Word in 2018 to read through the Bible together. Joshua is a part of the unfolding story of God's mission to rescue humanity from choices we made in the garden. And as we pick through the book of Joshua, we'll find narrative threads that run all the way back to Genesis and some that go all the way forward to Jesus. Anytime you turn to an Old Testament book, there's a question that kind of hangs in the air. Can anything this old be relevant to what I'm dealing with now or to what I will face in the foreseeable future? I mean, other than some interesting or entertaining stories, what does a book written 14 centuries before Jesus bring to the table? Okay, this is Huntsville, so I know that this crowd knows Newton's first law of motion, inertia. An object will stay at rest or stay in motion unless it's acted upon by some external force. That's not just a law of physics. That's a law of life. Our lives can be locked into a stubborn status quo where nothing changes. There's a phrase Don Henley sings at the end of the Eagles song, The Sad Cafe, which may be the greatest song ever written, if for no other reason than the sax solo at the end. It's a lament. 
And, and it's one I suspect a lot of us might hold as an unspoken complaint at times in our lives. Here's the phrase. Things in this life change very slowly if they ever change at all. In The Pretender, Jackson Brown sings essentially the same lament, different words, different tune. I want to know what became of the changes we waited for love to bring. John Mayer echoes that angst with waiting on the world to change. And then Pete Townsend of The Who turned it into a protest, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And you and I have our own ways of expressing our frustration with the inertia, the monotony, the tedious identicalness that locks our lives into the cement of sameness. Somebody asks, how are you? And you say, oh, you know, same old, same old, living the dream, by which we mean we're not really living the dream at all. Or we talk about life kind of like I'm on a hamster wheel, or I'm on a treadmill, or I'm in the daily grind, or I'm running around in circles, same circus, different clowns. You've probably heard other more colorful ways to express that, but we're in church. Of course, the ultimate abdication, abdication to inertia is, and, and I bet you said this this week, it is what it is. It is what it is. If we remain stuck too long in that stubborn status quo, the rusts of boredom and despair and hopelessness can begin to eat into our souls. And so let me just ask, do you feel stuck? Do you feel plateaued? Maybe even trapped? Have you recently had the thought that nothing is going to change? That nothing can change? That your life is going to remain ever a dull moment? And while we're at it, we should turn that mirror on ourselves as a church. Do we feel stuck? Do we feel plateaued? Like we've taken the mission and the message of God as far into this community as we can take it, that as a church we've driven, in, we've driven into a deep rut and we can't seem to steer out of it because it just is what it is. If any of that resonates with you in any way, on any level, then this 30 century old book is relevant. It's relevant because it tells the story of how an external force called God overcame the inertia in which the people of Israel were locked. For 400 years, they had been slaves in Egypt. If you had been a part of the, Israel, the nation of Israel in year 399 of that captivity, that would have meant that you, had been a, that, that you had been doing exactly the same thing in exactly the same place, suffering exactly the same oppression that your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents and your great-great-grandparents had suffered before you. You were living with a legacy of multi-generational inertia. Nothing had changed. But the inertia of that centuries-long captivity had been broken by a dramatic intervention of force by a force named God. That's the book of Exodus, the 10 plagues and all that. And even though Israel longed, maybe for centuries, to be liberated from the oblivion of that oppression, when they were finally liberated and had the chance to, to walk into a new destiny, they hesitated right on the threshold. If you're following the read scripture schedule, we read, actually read about that this week. In the book of Numbers, chapter 14, Israel is a moment away from receiving the, 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 the promise that God had given to Abraham. I mean, they're on the edge. They're about to step into it. They're this close. But then they take a poll, and they find out that public support for this new reality is trending down and fear is trending up, and the momentum God had given them is meeting resistance. Here's Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Listen, then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. You're on the edge of the promised land, and they're weeping about it. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. I'm going to blog about grumbling later on today, so you people need to read that. The whole congregation said to them, would that, would that we had died in the land of Egypt. 
Or would that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? The promise of a new place to live, a new way to live, was aborted by their fear of the next and their fondness for the familiar. And so God, as he is wont to do, confirmed them in their choice. It's one of the really terrifying things about God is that if you and I make choices, God says, okay, that's what you wanted. With but two exceptions, anyone 20 years or older was condemned to wander in the wilderness until they died, Joshua and Caleb, for another four decades. Four decades more, they lived as nomads, they lived as a people without a country. Now, you and I know this dynamic, all right? We, we, we get this. Big life transitions, even to inarguably better futures, are hard. The comfortable, the known, the familiar, all, all of that exerts a sun-like gravitational pull on us. And once we've been drawn into the orbit of the status quo, even a really rotten status quo, it is exceptionally difficult to generate enough escape velocity to climb out of the gravity well of what we have become accustomed to. We just like the familiar, even if it stinks. It's not just true of Israel, ancient Israel. It's our truth. I mean, somebody challenges you that, that you know, you need to change. And, and, and it's a change you know you should make. Heck, it's a change you want to make. And then you reply, I reply, I, I can't. This is just who I am. You ever said that? This is just who I am. In a marriage, two people live in the same dysfunction. Neither one of them likes how they relate. Both say they wish things would change, but when pushed to reply, they say, just is what it is. Or turn the mirror back on us as a church again. Churches do the same thing. We can become addicted to comfort, so captivated by and committed to how we do things that we confuse our methods with God's mission. And then when somebody suggests we, re, we, we change it, we, we go like, well, we've always done it this way. There are few tyrannies like the tyranny of it is what it is. And if the book of Joshua teaches us anything at all, it is this. It isn't what it is. How things are are not how things will always be. How things are are not how things will always be. I'll tell you why that's true in just a moment. First, I want to hear the first nine verses of Joshua chapter 1 with you. Uh, one commentator wrote, uh, that an air of joyful optimism pervades the book of Joshua. I think you'll see that as we listen together. I'm reading from the uh, English Standard Version. Here we go. First nine verses, Joshua chapter one. I, I never told you to turn to Joshua, right? Astute sermon listeners probably got there anyway. So the rest of you turn to Joshua chapter one. Listen to this. This is awesome. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Boy, there's a way to start, isn't it? Moses is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law, see, God even wanted Joshua to be in the Read Scripture program. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, 
but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There are two words in those nine verses that would have rocked your world had you been a part of that 40-year wilderness status quo. When we read the words, we rolled right by them like a speed sign on the Autobahn. Didn't even see them. But when Joshua and Israel heard them, everything came to a whiplash-inducing full stop. Those two words are in verse 4 at the very end. Your territory. They, they had never set foot on a piece of land they could call their own. And now every piece of land they set their foot on was going to be their territory. How things are, how things have always been, is not how things will always be. For two reasons. First, when God makes a promise, he never forgets. Look at verse 3. God tells Joshua, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. That promise was a few decades old by this point, but it's actually much older than that. 600 years earlier, God had promised Abraham that one day he would give his descendants this land, and now it's coming true. Now, neither you nor I are beneficiaries of that land promise, but God has made a promise to us, too. It's a promise to do something new. Eight centuries before Jesus, Isaiah put it this way. He said, behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness. I will make rivers in the desert. A hundred years later, the prophet Jeremiah wrote about that new thing that God was going to do in Jeremiah chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel in those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. Other prophets talk about this new thing that God is going to do. And so what was the new thing that God had promised that he would do? It wasn't land. It was a person. It was a new relationship. Jesus came, bringing what he called in Matthew 19, new wine and fresh wineskins. In Luke 22, Jesus called it the new covenant. In Mark chapter 1, when the people heard him teach, they called it a new teaching. In Romans 6, Paul said that baptism into Christ means that we could walk in newness of life. In 2 Corinthians 5, he said that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. She is a new creation. And there's more. In Revelation 21, God promises that he will make all things new. Could you use some new would you like to be out of the inertia that is in your life, out of the stuck status quo into the new thing that God is, can, and will be doing? How things are are not how things will always be because, because God never makes a promise he does not keep. And second, God never starts a project he does not finish. The book of Joshua is about the completion of one phase of a project that God began with Abraham. The project was to bless all nations through Abraham's descendants. A subsequent phase of that project was the actual blessing when Jesus came. And then Jesus himself inaugurated yet another phase of God's eternal project. And here's how he put it as he inaugurated that phase in Matthew chapter 28. 
Jesus said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. If you think about it, the first chapter of Joshua and what we just read there in the last chapter of Matthew sound a lot alike. In both passages, God tells his, people, tells his people it's time to go. To Joshua, he says, it's time for you guys to go into the land. Jesus tells his disciples, it's time for you to go into all the world. In, in both passages, he promises to be with them in their going. God told Joshua, I will be with you. Jesus told his disciples, I will be with you to the very end of the age. In, in Joshua, God tells Joshua to be careful to obey all the law. Jesus says, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. I guess you could say that Joshua chapter 1 is the great commission of the Old Testament. There's one huge difference between the two stories. Huge difference. Joshua chapter 1 begins, remember that inauspicious, inauspicious start? It begins by telling us that Moses, Israel's leader, is dead. The gospel of Matthew ends by telling us that Jesus is alive. More than anything, that's how we know that inertia cannot hold us forever, that the status quo is not static, that it is what it is, isn't. And that how things are is not how they will always be. That's good news. Let's stand. We're going to sing together. Seeker, promise keeper, you finish what you begin. Your provision through the desert, you see it through. Lord, I-
could you be seated for uh, three and a half more minutes? Uh, I want to show you a video real quick. We have a special contribution coming up in a few weeks, first part of March, for our missions, our one and only missions program, Hacienda End of Hope. Check out this video. If you're a long-term Twickenham member, you will probably recognize the face on the screen. My family and I first visited Twickenham Church of Christ in 2004. It just so happened the first Sunday that we were visiting, they showed a video about the Hacienda of Hope in Ecuador. I knew in that moment that God had me involved in this ministry in some way. I just wasn't sure how. The next summer, I went with the youth group of Twickenham to Ecuador. And from that point on, I've pretty much gone every year since then. I just knew that this ministry had my heart and that I was going to be a part of it. Ecuador is a beautiful country. Unfortunately, there's a high poverty rate in Ecuador. Around five and a half million children live in Ecuador, and of those, only one in five only live in a home that is free from neglect and abuse. Statistics show that 61% of Ecuadorian girls between the ages of 10 and 15 suffer from some form of sexual abuse, aggression, or assault, and usually this takes place in their own home. Teenage pregnancies are high. One in five girls between the ages of 15 and 19 become mothers. And then they struggle to stay in school and take care of their child. There are very few orphanages in Ecuador, much less Christian ones. Yet the need for helping abused and neglected children is so great. That's why the Hacienda of Hope is so unique. We provide a safe, loving Christian environment to these children. We also provide a Christian education that they can learn English in the school. This will afford them the opportunity to get a better job in Ecuador and in turn give back to the community and to help those hurting and abandoned children like they once were. My husband Larry and I were in a transition in the year of 2015 and 16. So we spent a year just trying to uh, pray over our situation and see where God wanted us to be and how he was going to use us. So we moved to Nashville in 2016, but I especially wanted to be in a place where I knew that God was leading us so that we could gain support and um, interest in the Hacienda of Hope. We have hosted the directors of the orphanage and also the academy school directors in our home several times over this last year. We also had the opportunity to introduce Justin and John Rieger to our congregation here in Nashville. And um, I'm really excited about the opportunity to take a group of Lipscomb University students to Ecuador this coming spring break. God is continuing to open the door to allow me to speak about the passion that I have for this ministry, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity for it. So my prayer is that you will join us in this mission. That uh, special contribution will take place, place first Sunday in March. I think that's the 4th, so please keep that in your prayers. Would you stand, please? I'm going to leave you with this blessing from uh, a recent reading in Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And may you share that peace with all whom you meet this week. Be blessed. Have a great week.